Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the director here with the Georgia Center for the Book. On behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the DeKalb County Public Library, welcome to another in our continuing series of author events that we're presenting to you virtually via Zoom. A few reminders before we begin this evening's event. If you would like to purchase a copy of the book, our bookseller for this evening is Eagle Eye Books, and you'll find a link to order a copy in the chat section. Um, we do have to tell you that we have a small number of book plates that Sarah has sent um, ahead of time. So if you would like a signed copy, um, you can have one of those. She has also said that she is willing to send more if they do run out. So I thank you in advance for ordering from one of our independent bookstores. They've done so much during the pandemic to deliver books by mail, books to your doorstep, or provide contactless pickup. Um, so we can continue to read these wonderful, wonderful books that have come out this year. I'd also like to remind you that after our presentation this evening, if you would like to ask our guests questions, please feel free to type those in the Q&A feature that you find in the Zoom. You will find that either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on the device that you're viewing this session in. It just helps us keep track and make sure that we don't lose any questions in the chat. I'm very excited to tell you this evening that we have not only one, but two guests for you to talk about, of course, monarch butterflies this evening. Our first guest this evening is Susan Myers. Uh, she is, after visiting Mexican overwintering colonies with Dr. Bill Colbert in March, 2003, Susan began volunteering with Monarchs Across Georgia, a committee of Environmental Education Alliance of Georgia. She facilitates educator workshops using Monarchs and more curriculum and incorporates the citizen science projects at MLMP, Journey North Tracking, Monarch Watch Tagging, and the Way Stations, and Project Monarch Health. Susan is a trainer for MLMP and coordinates Integrated Monarch Monitoring Project in Georgia. She administers MAG's Pollinator Habitat Restoration Grants since 2012 through FWS's Partners in Fish and Wildlife Program and was honored with a Conservation Partner Award for her work with Monarchs in the 2015-2016 Southeast Regional Directors Honors Award Ceremony. She has also organized trips to Mexican overwintering colonies since 2004. She initiated the Mexico Book Project, bringing books written in Spanish to schools near the sanctuaries. In 2018, Susan agreed to coordinate the Symbolic Monarch Migration, a 22-year program created by the Journey North. Susan received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Microbiology and her Master's of Science degree in Environmental Science from Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, and Florida Institute of Technology, respectively. She retired as an instructor from Stone Mountain Memorial Association, where she taught kindergarten through 12th grade students on a variety of science-based lessons from geology to life cycles. Susan is also a Georgia Master Gardener, Master Naturalist, and Certified Environmental Educator. Our author this evening is, of course, Sarah Dykeman, the founder of beyondabook.org, which fosters lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. She works as an amphibian research and in an outdoor educator, guiding young people into nature so they can delight in its complicated brilliance. She hopes her own adventures, walking from Mexico to Canada, canoeing on the Missouri River with a source to the sea, and cycling over 80,000 miles across North and South America, including the Monarch Migration Trip, will empower young and old to dream big. Of course, we all know that the monarch butterfly and the migration and their habitat on that migration is a plight that we all should be aware of. Their um, habitat has been decreased due to the way we live, how we live and what we buy. Although they do receive some praise and some recognition, they are, the state insect for seven states, not Georgia's, um, but if you know the Georgia state butterfly and the state insect, feel free to type that in chat. We may come up with something for you. But this is a wonderful book that I had a chance to read and it was the perfect time to read it on this wet, dreary, gray day here in Georgia. That talked about this wonderful trip that began at El Rosario Colony in Michoacan, Mexico and ended of course, in Sudbury, Ontario, and then came back with the monarchs. Finding wonderful things along the way, monarch butterflies, of course, underneath the trees, suffering from the cold, 
small other animal friends. But while this started out as an academic journey for Sarah, it became so much more. And as she said in the book, she was using her body and time and her voice to speak for these monarchs. So I think it would be all fitting that I turn the microphone over to her and let her speak about her book, Bicycling with Butterflies. Sarah? Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here today, talk about, talk about butterflies, talk about bikes. And in fact, what I, what I want to do today is I prepared a, a presentation to show, show off some photos. And it's going to be a little primer on monarch biology for folks that maybe don't know the, the basics of that. And then a primer on bike touring for folks that are like, wait, what? You ride your bike? What? How does that work? And then I'll, I'll jump into some stories. Before I do anything else, though, I just I have to stop here and and do some some thanks. It's some much deserved thanks. I want to thank um, Susan. That was an amazing introduction that just so much. She's doing so much for the monarchs and there's there's more that wasn't even there. And it's the, the monarchs just are uh, like it's. It's so it's so awesome to be on the same team as Susan and and to feel her energy and to be inspired by her and and all the people doing great things. So thanks, Susan, for uh, helping bring this make this all happen and rallying for the monarch and and thanks the folks for the folks at Georgia Center for the book. It's super wonderful to have venues like this to to extend my voice and to get to get folks that might not know as much about monarchs or bike touring into into the fold and also thanks to eagle eye books they, just like like joe said there they have some some of my fancy signatures and and some art plates this is this is uh, some of my watercolors um so i have one of my favorite watercolors I, I made prints of it and so you can support them and support me and support the monarchs all at the same time and then of course i want to thank all of you guys for coming out my book um, one of my favorite parts of my book is in fact my acknowledgement section my trip was in fact a solo trip, but it was made possible only because there are one millions of monarchs and two because thousands of people really came through for me and I fought hard for the acknowledge acknowledgement section to be as long as it was. It, it started off at like 14 pages and my publisher was like, no, you can't have a 14 page acknowledgement that's longer than any chapter of your book. So I whittled it down to seven and I have the names of all the families I stayed with, that's 68 families. And they fed me, countless more people um, gave me all, all of the support I needed along the way. I didn't have a sag wagon or anything like that, but I, I had support and it is what made the trip possible and it's what continues to make this adventure possible. So thanks, thanks to everyone. Um, so I have a presentation, like I said, I'm gonna do a little configuration. I, I do it a little different than I've seen other Zooms do it. So if for some reason it's just not working for you, you can throw it in the chat and and I'll see if I can't um, just go back to the normal mute mode. So here we go. And this should only take like five or 10 minutes. So just sit back, just kidding. All right, so hopefully you see um, me and a butterfly. If you don't, someone can jump in on, and say so. Um, well, and like I said, that this is well that I followed the butterfly, and I'm going to do a, a quick primer on the monarch butterfly. The the this this is an example of a, of a monarch, and here you can actually see this is a male monarch because it has these these black scent pouches, and it's on some milkweed. And this was the monarch I followed, and and this is the monarch's range. So I'm actually going to make my map a little bit bigger here for a sec, so you can really see. And don't worry if all the all the font is a little too small i'll walk you through it but basically this is the range of the monarch and it has it's color coded because the monarchs are migratory so anywhere that you see yellow that's where the monarchs spend the summer months the green is where they spend the spring orange is where they spend the fall and the blue is where they go in the winter and you can see the winter range is much, much smaller than the summer range. And so that what that means is, is when the monarchs go to say Mexico, they are in these concentrated bundles. They're in these things called colonies and they, they cling to the branches of the trees and that's where they spend their winter, pretty much just being still in the, in the, in the, in the branches. 
And then of course they spread out in the summer. And they do this because if they stayed in this, the summer months, if they stayed up here in the summer, they would freeze to death in the winter. But they don't wanna stay here in Mexico all, win all summer because there's not as much milkweed. So it's this, they, they do this kind of back and forth so they can take advantage of the, the right temperature to survive in the winter and plenty of milkweed in the spring and summer. Now, the only other thing I wanna to call to attention on this route is that I started, sorry, this is, this is my route. You might not have, I forgot to explain the red line. The, the red line is my route. And I started here in Mexico where they overwinter and I went north into Canada, did a big loop back to the Midwest and then straight down to um, Michoacan in Mexico. And this was a 10,201 mile route. It was an eight and a half month journey for me and the monarchs. And what I wanted to start to say was that the monarchs that I started with, well, they were not the monarchs I finished with. So this loop that the monarchs do is multi-generational and it takes about three to five generations of monarchs to, to do this entire loop. So when I was in Texas heading back south, the monarchs I was seeing, I, I never got tired of seeing a monarch and thinking to myself, you are going to a place that you have never been before and you're going to fly to the exact same trees as your great great grandparents and you're probably going to beat me there and and just every time seeing that seeing a monarch my mind was really just blown away and i i just i'm so fascinated by the monarch and i'm so thrilled to to keep learning about them and to keep being amazed by them so that's a little a little bit about the the monarch um, biology. There's way more. Like I could talk about monarch science all day. I have learned so many incredible things from biking with the monarchs. And then as I wrote the book, I, I read lots of scientific, scientific papers. And it's just the more you know, the more complicated the, the history, the, the ecology is, the more amazed you become. And I, I hope more and more people can discover what, what I, I call them like secrets. I hope as people discover these secrets, they'll start to look in their yards and they'll start to see monarchs in a whole new light. So that's really the point of my trip. I did this 10,000 mile loop in order to call to attention the, the monarch, how amazing it is and how we can all be part of the solution. But before I get any more into that, I wanna do a quick primer on bicycle touring. This is me, I think I'm somewhere in Vermont in this picture. There's a bunch of common milkweed in the background. So beautiful, it's my, my favorite milkweed. They're like friends and they have these, I, whenever I see them, they're, I just like, it feels like a friend greeting me and they have these beautiful purple blossoms of shooting star like flowers and they smell so good. So I took thousands of pictures of common milkweed. And this is my bike. You can see it's nothing fancy. In fact, I bought it used I put it together from used parts and it's a, it's a little bit of a, a Frankenstein bike, but it gets the job done, it's comfortable and I don't have to worry about people like wanting to steal it because it, it's not anything special. Um, and then on my bike, I have these panniers. These are store-bought panniers in the front. That's where I store things like my sleeping bag, sleeping pad, computer, things that I really wanna make sure stay dry. And then in the back, these panniers are actually made from old kitty litter buckets. And on the outside, those are server aprons that I bought at a thrift store so I could have pockets on the outside. And in these panniers, I would hold um, food. So I usually carry about a day worth of food. I had a little stove and a cook set, as well as things like my rain gear, my supplies for fixing my bike, and whatever random odds and ends I, I picked up along the way, because I'm a bit of a hoarder. I, like to find trash on the side of the road. I actually collect metal spoons, strangely enough, and I've I found about 400 metal spoons on my bike tours. So I squirrel things away and realize every few months that I'm carrying like 30 pounds more than I need to and I'll, I'll clean things up. But this is my bike and, and the, the, what I really love about my bike is that route I showed you. That route really came together as I pedaled. So a lot of the time I didn't know where I was going to spend the night. Now, sometimes I knew because someone had invited me to stay at their house, and so I was aiming for their house, and I knew I would probably be there in, a, in two days or something like that. But a lot of the time, I would start in the morning with no idea where I was gonna where I was gonna end up. Um, but because I have everything I need on my bike, well, that really took away the pressure, and I just always felt really confident that I was gonna be okay. And so that meant I could eat when I was hungry, 
And this is a picture of me cooking. I actually didn't cook all that often. I'm a pretty lazy cook. If I can, if I can eat in a way that avoids dishes and cutting things up, I will. So I'd often just make sandwiches or eat apples and peanut butter, bananas and peanut butter and, and lots of things with peanut butter. Um, but don't worry, I stayed with lots of people and they supplemented my pretty, pretty terrible sandwich diet <laughs> along the way, luckily. And because I'm on a bike, I also get to stop whenever I want. So I stop for creatures big and small. Here's some, some dinosaurs at a state park in Texas, not real by the way. And then we have some Indian paintbrush down here. And when you're in a car and you see something interesting, you might look out and you might say, oh, that looks cool. Oh, let's just find a pull out. And by the time you found a safe spot to pull out, you know, you're three miles down the road and you think, oh, now I have to turn around. No, uh, let's just keep going. But when you're on a bike, you just tap your brakes, toss your bike to the side of the road, scramble into the ditch and go exploring. And I did this every day, all day. I stopped so much. I tried to go about 60 miles a day, which means if you're going about 10 miles an hour, that means about six hours a day of actual riding. Well, there's a lot more hours in the day to eat and, and sleep and of course, just explore. And, that, and that's what I did for the most part, lots of exploring. In fact, one time I was in Texas and the, I, I look up from the ditch and there's some cops, or not some cops, there's a cop on the, on the highway medium and he gets out of his car and he looks at me and he's like, you okay? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And he's like, people have been calling to say that a cyclist had crashed. So people had seen me crawling in the ditch and thought I had crashed, I guess. And so I said, no, no, I'm fine. You wanna, you wanna come check out the caterpillars I just found? And then that cop, he just slowly backed away, got in his car and drove off. Yeah, he, he wanted nothing to do with, with monarchs or, or caterpillars. And that's really the truth of it, right? Is, people are zooming by all day and they don't see these spectacular creatures that are living right next next to them. And they don't stop to, to see just how wonderful and exciting and amazing the, the neighbors that we live with are, the, the more than human, human neighbors. So that's a great re reason to, to bike is it really slows you down and it really helps you see all the, all the sights. And the last reason to bike tour is it's so easy to camp. I never paid to camp on my trip. I camp, I do what you call stealth camping, which is where you camp pretty much in plain sight, just off the road. Um, so here's my tent, if you can't see it. And I'm kind of, I'm hidden by a, a, a not a dip in the road, but a little, oh, what am, I can't think of the word. <laughs> you get my point. The, the way that the cars were, you, they couldn't quite see me. Here's the car. And so no one knew I was there and people always ask, oh my gosh, weren't you scared? Well, I'm, I'm way less scared in these, these kind of out of the way places because no one knows I'm there. No one's expecting to find me. No one could, could possibly find me. And, and so I, I do feel really safe. And if someone did see me on the side of the road, they would be more scared of me than I am of them. So I, I feel really lucky to be able to camp like this. It's, it would obviously be a lot harder, say if I was a black man, I think, if someone did see me, they might not just ignore me. And I'm sure people saw me from time to time. But for, for me, this was a great way to travel. And I, I really do hope that we can create a world where, where everyone can travel like this. And, and especially because this is how monarchs travel. And, and this experience bonded me to the experience of the monarch. So I have to imagine that there were times when the monarch was flying north and they landed on just like this perfect spot. It had everything they needed. It had like some some nectar, it had some milkweed, it had some a, a nice tree to shelter at night in. And then there were nights where they would bike, or not bike, where they would fly and fly and fly and there would just be pavement and green grass and fields of, of crops and there was just nowhere for them to go. And that's kind of how my trip was too. Some days it would just be perfect. It would be like the perfect flat spot with a view and a tree to lean my bike up against. And other nights I'd have to bike one or two extra hours just trying to find a place. And I, I think that one of our goals is to make sure that monarchs as travelers have a, have a safe place to, to go every night. Now I get to this part of the presentation and people are like, yeah, no thanks, I'm not interested in bike touring. <laughs> but I have two, two reasons that it's the, the way to go. And first, so easy to clean your house. All you have to do is lift up your tent and shake it out. <laughs> And so this is the only time in my life where I clean my house every day. 
And the other reason is you meet amazing people and they really help you out. And this is where the adventure is. When you're on a bike, you're really vulnerable. And so you have to trust people. And in turn, by giving them your trust, you, you receive a, a lot as well. And I have received so many invitations. I've stayed with multiple people that weren't even home. They just told me where they left the keys and I would open their door. There would be no one there. I've never met them. And a few days later, I'd lock the door, hide the key again and leave. And that's a beautiful thing in, in this day and age. And I'm, I'm so grateful for it. And, and this picture in particular, I love this. This man stopped me on a highway in Mexico. It was so hot and the road was so long and it was pretty straight and a little boring. So I was kind of zoning out and then he pulls up and I'm like, oh boy, what does this guy want? And he's like, do you want ice cream? And one of my rules on bike touring is always say yes, if, as long as you feel safe. And, and so I, I really do try and say yes to all the as many opportunities as I can. That's where the, the real adventure lies. And so I said, I said yes to the ice cream. And it wasn't just people I met randomly. A lot of people contacted me while I was on the road and they said, hey, can you swing by my house? Hey, I wanted you to come to my school and give a presentation. And, and just like saying yes, or my saying yes rule, I, I did try and say yes. I mean, sometimes I'd look at my map and I'd look at where they lived and I'd think, I don't think that's possible. My legs are, <laughs> my legs would hate me. Um, but I do have to say in the beginning of my trip, my route didn't actually go to Southern Ontario but I got so many emails from folks in Southern Ontario saying, oh, you have to do this. It's gonna be so awesome. Oh, this is what we're doing. We're doing this, we're doing this, that I did add about a thousand miles to go to Southern Ontario in the, in the beginning of, of stages of my bike tour. I couldn't do that so much once I, I'd locked down, down um, events and, stu and such. Now, another reason that I feel like I've kind of bonded to the experience of the monarch is showcased in this picture. And this picture is, this woman's name is Margaret and she's a dairy farmer in Canada. And she invited me to her house. And when she said, hey, do you want some homemade ice cream for my dairy cows? I like said <laughs> an emphatic yes. And oh man, it was such good ice cream. But what I love about this picture is while Margaret is feeding me, who else is she feeding in the background there? Well, she's feeding all, all sorts of pollinators, including monarchs. And it, it came to be that the people that I stayed with were often the people helping the monarchs. And so just as the monarchs find relief at visiting Margaret's yard, I found relief visiting Margaret's and her house. And in fact, I showed up just drenched from a, a rainstorm, a, a, like a several day rainstorm. So I was just so grateful to, to get a warm shower at Margaret's house. And it's really, really important that we have people like Margaret helping and having gardens because this is, this is the reality of the monarch population. And again, you might be squinting at a small screen and the numbers aren't important. What's important is this is a graph of the monarch population. And what's important is if you squint your eyes, you'll actually see a trend line. And you'll see that the monarch population goes up and down over time. This is totally natural with all wildlife populations. But the difference is in this case, the monarch populations are going up, down, up, down, up, down, but there's a general trend also downward. And downward is bad. Downward leads to a population of zero, leads to extinction. And the monarchs as a species aren't in danger of, of extinction. There's monarchs all over the world, but the, the phenomenon, the, the migration from Mexico to Canada and back, that is in, in danger. And, and that's, what, that's why I'm here tonight. And that's why so many of you have gardens and are, are doing your part. And, and I really truly believe, I think the most beautiful thing about the monarch is that they invite everyone to help. There is no one living in the United States that can't be part of the solution. There's no one in Southern Ontario that can't be part of the solution for the monarch. And when you protect the monarch, you're protecting so much more. And so I'm, I'm excited to invite people tonight to, to be part of this team. And everyone, I, I say this from the bottom of my heart, everyone has a role to play. And, and like, in fact, I don't, I don't have a yard, I don't have a lawn to, to plant natives as much. But I have found found my my way to be part of the team by by using my voice, and this was a key part of my trip. I became a voice for the monarch, and I visited schools. I gave presentations to schools and at nature centers, and I talked I talked formally to about nine thousand people, and informally to thousands more. The the great thing about a bike tour is, 
people come up to you and they say, where are you going? And I'm like, okay, you ask, well, here's where I'm going and this is why. And by the time they're done, I know they know about the, more about the monarch than maybe they ever wanted to know. And then I think, wow, look, they're going to go home tonight around the dinner table and they're going to tell the story of the monarch. And that's how things spread. And that's how our voice spreads. And it was so important to, for me to do this because honestly, without, without being part of the solution in this way, the trip, I, I'm not sure I would have been able to make it through the trip. And, and this is why. Well, a lot of times on my ride, I would find lots of amazing um, creatures. So here I am, this is a very, this is a staged photo, but it's very much like what would happen. I would be riding my bike and I would spot some common milkweed usually. Common milkweed is the one I saw the most, surprisingly, by, based on the name, common. And I would spot some common milkweed and then I'd kind of start looking closer for, for caterpillars. And their calling signs were either the, the big, the, if you can see right here, there's a little bit of frass, that's caterpillar poo. I would often see the frass before I'd see the caterpillar or I'd see the white marks where the, the caterpillars had been eating. Um, but I'd see a caterpillar and I'd slam on my brakes and I'd throw my bike down and then I'd start looking looking in the, the, the ditches for all the cool insects. And here's a fifth and star caterpillar. And I probably spent an hour just crawling around in this part of the ditch, taking photos and, and just discovering the, the little secrets that are right there. And this was so fun. But then, you know, a few miles down the road, I'd find this. And it hurts. Like, it hurts to fall in love with a creature and, and then see this. And it, it hurts to train your eyes to see the world through the eyes of a butterfly. Because there's a, there's a lot of times where what you see is not pretty. <laughs> what you see is not, not helpful. And I could get really sad. I, I biked 10,000 miles almost exclusively by myself. So I had a lot of time to think. And on these moments where you just bike by rows and rows of mowed grass, like it would fester. And it was all day, every day. It was, in, it was these green grass lawns that were huge, that were just quite frankly, a waste of space. And, and I, I don't wanna be mad at people that have these gardens because what I, I know is that people that have, have these green grass lawns they're trying to be good neighbors. They're trying to be part of the solution, or not the solution. They're, they're just trying to, trying to be good neighbors, trying to make their yards look nice. But what, what we need right now is a paradigm shift. We need to see that this is actually not being a good neighbor. We need to think about our more than human neighbors. We need to think about the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the frogs and, and all the creatures that share this planet with us. And then we need to turn around and share. And, there's so much potential here. Like there's so much potential. And, and I wanna talk about a little of that potential because this is where I found my medicine. Finding people that were, that were changing the way, we, the way we see our lawns, the way we see our earth, the way, the way we think about sharing the planet. This was how I managed to make it through. So I'd get really, really angry and then say I'd visit a school. And this was a school in Omaha. This is a, a small school garden. The teacher told me that before it was just a little green, a green plot of land around or near the, the parking lot that was super hard to mow. Like it just was pretty much neglected because it was like a steep slope. And she said, hey, can I turn it into a butterfly garden? And everyone was like, I don't know, weeds, blah, blah, blah. And she really pressed the point and she got her garden and it was a entire school endeavor. And so now these kids have this, this scientific laboratory and they have this connection to the earth and they're they're connected to Mexico through the butterflies that visit them. And I went out of my way happily to visit the school. And I did a presentation at the school and then we went out to the garden and I actually wanna pause this real quick and read one of, one of my favorite parts of, of my book um, only because it's just, it is truly medicine. And I'm just, I'm thrilled to be able to sh share this story with you all and, and hopefully inspire some more gardens. So this is, um, directly about this, this school here. Even in the bluster of youthful energy allowed to roam free, I felt something akin to peace as we huddled around a milkweed plant to discover the garden's secrets. The milkweed, poked and prodded, began to ooze tiny bubbles of white latex sap. The tiny drops at first confused the kids. Eggs, they exclaimed, wild with excitement. Look closer, I countered. It was not up to me to correct them. The garden was their teacher. 
It's sap, they squealed, delighted to have touched poison. As the group dispersed, shouting erupted. Real monarch eggs had been discovered by the young scientist. Every day of my trip was an iteration of such learning. I could have studied thick research books on monarchs or read a hundred field guides on milkweed, but crouching in their world, trading carbon dioxide for monoxide, I learned real lessons that I would not forget after a test or a summer break. My senses wrote pages in my mind that could have filled textbooks. My curiosity turned the pages. A monarch, a group of third graders exclaimed, their fingers and eyes tracking the sky. Like an echo, the whole class joined to watch the monarch float over our heads. Their pure delight and his delicate orange wings filled my heart with hope. Human beings were not made to fight nature. Human beings are made of nature. When we are released to waltz among gardens, unburdened by the appetite of power, we can see our home in nature and see that we share our home with monarch butterflies. That monarch was a messenger. It christened the air with wing beats and ordained each scientist, each, excuse me, each student as a scientist, conservationist, and member of our shared planet. That monarch connected the students to Mexico, Canada, and New York City, not just an unnamed patch of schoolyard in Nebraska. He had navigated an un unwelcoming ecosystem of grass, pavement, cement, brick, tile, plastic, shingle, and wood and found refuge in the class's small garden. That monarch was proof that when we give nature room, it will thank us with color and so much more. I stood, as stunned as the students. Until a monarch finds you, until your paths cross, the astonishment you will feel can only be a word on a page. Until every kid feels that connection, we are failing them. I began to envision a garden at every school, providing every student with a living laboratory and a real life connection with nature. The monarch could become a symbol of our shared responsibility, shared planet, and the power of our combined efforts. With a native butterfly garden at each school, it wouldn't matter where the kids lived, how their state representatives voted, what they looked like, how they talked, or how much money their families made. The monarchs could connect us all, reminding us that we are all creatures that deserve to be seen as amazing. And I, I really believe that. I think the monarch is is a guide and I think the monarch is an invitation for us to to see the world in a new way and and so I carried this story of these kids in my heart and it, it helped with the miles that were a lot of corn it really did and I want to go over a little bit more of the medicine this is Bill he's a farmer he um, with his family owns Native American seed in, in Texas and he started his career planting Bermuda grass lawns as a landscaper and one day he was like, what am I doing? Like I live in Texas. Why are we watering this grass when there's these native plants that have adapted to Texas summers and Texas heat and Texas rainfall? And so he pivoted and he actually started a, a, a farm to grow natives, harvest the seeds and then sell those seeds so that more people could replant Texas. And, and I stayed with them twice on my, on my trip and it was such an inspiration, Bill was, Bill is so amazing and I saw so many monarchs on his on his on his property and I was like almost in tears seeing milkweed in the rose <laughs> and and so again medicine and then of course there were all the school guard or excuse me all the all the gardens at people's houses I stayed at and, and this is one of my favorite gardens because it's it's such a good example of what it means to share so this is Amy's garden in Tulsa Oklahoma and we have a green grass we have some a, a patio and then we have this garden and it's a mix of natives and non-natives and all those the green the bright green there is is common milkweed and it seems like small it seems maybe not important but by the time i got there amy had said that there were already 40 eggs she'd already found 40 eggs on her milkweed plants and here's the most amazing thing for me is if even just one of those eggs survives well that's 500 eggs for the next generation and if one of those or 1% of those, well, that could lead to thousands more eggs by the time the third generation gets to Canada. And I love thinking, well, there's a chance, there's a possibility, it's very slim, but it's, there's a possibility that one of the eggs that's, that was given a home in Amy's garden, one of those eggs could have metamorphosed and a descendant of that egg could have visited someone that's watching tonight. And that is just so beautiful. That just, it just proves that we really are all connected by butterflies and that one, if one of us helping in our own way really helps all of us. 
And so don't be discouraged about the size of your garden. Start small, especially, you know, if you're a little nervous or if your neighbors are a little more like, you need to have green grass, start small and really allow that to spread. And, and here's a great example of that. This is like the most, one of the most amazing gardens I saw. This is Nadia's garden in Columbia, Missouri. And you can see where the property line ends and her backyard is covered in natives and so is her front yard. And I think it's so important for us to not just put our natives in the backyard. We need to be proud of native plants and we need to showcase them because we need our neighbors to see them. We need the people driving down the road to see them. We need to just send this message that like, these are beautiful, this is what we want. And so I love that Nadia had this garden in the front yard, but you can see her neighbors, they're a little more skeptical of this idea, but there's some common milkweed right here popping up. And I asked her about it and she said, well, the neighbors learned that if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. And I might've actually just glanced over this, but milkweed is the only food source of the monarch caterpillars. Sorry if you did not know that and you're like, why is she still talking about milkweed? But it's the only food source of the monarch caterpillar. And so when the neighbors learned that, they started mowing around this, this trespassing milkweed. And so here it is. This is just a perfect example of not only is the, are the natives spreading when given the opportunity, but, but ideas as well. And I can't talk to everyone and you can't talk to everyone, but if, if we all tell someone, and if we're all an example for our, for our neighborhood, then that's, that's really powerful. And that's, that's how change happens. And, and so I actually think about the monarchs and I think, wow, they are just such a beautiful metaphor for this, right? Because when you go to Mexico and most of the time in Mexico, the monarchs are hanging from the branches quietly, still, they're very still. And that's to conserve their fat reserves. That's to conserve their energy so that in the spring they can fly back to Texas, lay their eggs, and then start the, start the, next, the next year's migration. But as the as this, um, winter turns to spring, it starts to get warmer and the sun will hit a, a cluster of monarchs and then they'll erupt to the sky and they'll start flying around. And it's, my, it's just my, my favorite thing in the world. And I'll go and visit them. I've, I've spent four winters in Mexico now and I've spent hours with my eyes closed just listening to the, the, their wings beating. And so my, my point is one monarch alone you can't hear, but millions of monarchs together create this beautiful humming song. And it's the same with us. One of our voices alone is just some random voice talking about monarchs, but if all of us are talking, it really adds up to something big. And the same goes when, this is what I said when they're in the clusters. Here is a, a monarch or a tree that's literally bending from the weight of monarchs. And again, one garden, one person, one voice alone doesn't do much, but when our efforts are combined, it adds up to something that's, that truly is unstoppable. We could metaphorically bend trees, just like the monarchs can. Four monarchs equals the weight of a dime. And, and so imagine how many you have to add up in order to bend a tree. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And it doesn't matter where you live. This is a monarch I saw in New York City, New York City. And, and they're happy anywhere. They will come if you give them a garden and they will find your garden. It's quite remarkable. And, and if you plant a garden, you're helping the monarchs. And one of the things I love is that the more you help the monarchs, I truly believe the more they help you. And that is just such a showcase from my work. The more I help the monarchs, the more opportunities I'm given, given. the more I am a voice for the monarch, the, the, more, the more people read my book, the, the more interviews I do. It's just the monarchs are thanking me every day. And I, I truly believe that, that they'll, they'll thank anyone who, who plants a garden. And this is, they'll, they'll thank you not just with beauty, but they'll also thank you by, by teaching you things and being your guide. And this is my case in point. This is a, a beautiful butterfly, a beautiful monarch. It's impossible not to fall in love with a butterfly like this. They're just so beautiful. But one of the things they'll do is they'll say, hey, come on in, come on into my world. It's, it's not as scary as it seems. And so people will be excited about the monarch and then they'll be like, I wanna learn about the caterpillars. And so they'll slow down and they'll start looking and they might find a caterpillar. And I guarantee you're not gonna find a monarch caterpillar driving 60 miles down the highway, 60 miles an hour, excuse me, down the highway. And as you're looking for the monarch caterpillars, you'll start to see the, find the tussock moths that also rely on milkweed. And you'll start to see the googly-eyed spiders that, that likely predate some of the monarch eggs. And you'll see the other hum or the other pollinators like this hummingbird moth. And you might even find my favorite animal in the world, 
uh, a little frog, and this is a frog seeking refuge in a common milkweed leaf. And all of these, these sightings, all of these other things you find are gifts from the monarch saying, thank you for helping us. Thanks for slowing down. Thanks for looking into our world. Here's, here's so much beauty. Here are the secrets to, to be seen. And, and so you don't have to go on a, on a 10,000 mile trip. You don't have to ride your bike through the deserts of Mexico or navigate New York City. I definitely got lost in New York City. And you don't have to even, even come up against the scariest animal of the trip. Here it was, a skunk in Texas. By the way, both of us were fine. But you don't have to, you don't have to travel through Canada to be part of the, the solution. All you have to do to have an adventure with the monarchs is plant a garden. And I guarantee you, if you plant a garden, they will gift you back so many experiences, so much beauty, so much wonder. And, and they'll do that because they are the true adventurers. And I guarantee you they'll, they'll, they'll find you. And, and I just have to say again, they are the true adventurers, right? They don't need bikes. They don't need bags. They don't need telephones or a network of, of people to, to feed them other than milkweed, of course, and, and nectar plants. They, they really just need that, that native land and they need us to share. So with that, I actually do wanna read, I, I talked a little more than I was thinking I would, but I want to read one more little section. It's just the last two paragraphs of my acknowledgements. I mentioned my acknowledgements in the beginning. I think it's, it's so important to recognize again that my trip was a solo bike tour, but only thanks to so many people. And I think the last two paragraphs really sum it up, so. I will read that and here we go. Thanks to everyone fighting in endlessly big and small ways on behalf of the monarchs and their neighbors. Our paths may not have crossed, but your efforts are seen, felt, and appreciated. Biking past an unmowed ditch or a lawn devoted to natives will always make me hoot with joy. And finally, with all my heart and soul, thanks to the monarchs. You amaze me. You have become my teachers, encouraging an adventure teaching me Spanish, watercolor, web design, video editing, photography, networking, public speaking, gardening, stewardship, science, and love. You've helped me write this book and every word of it is for you. And I truly believe that too. Without, without the monarchs, I would not have gone on an adventure like this. Without the monarchs, I would not have written a book. And, and so, I would I would love for for folks to 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 read about my trip to help help spread the word. This is the the watercolor print that you'll receive if you if you buy from if you're one of the the first folks to buy from Eagle Eye, Eye Bookstore. And of course, if you want to learn more or reach out to me in any way, my website is beyondabook.org. And with that, I want to turn it over to you all for questions. Um, you can put your questions in the question answer section and we'll go from there. So let me reconfigure things. And here we go. Thank you most, so much, Sarah. That was absolutely fantastic. And I loved seeing those pictures. Um, like Sarah said, go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them. And while you all are thinking, um, we were noticing in the chat section, a lot of you had questions for Susan. So why don't we bring Susan on to tell us a little bit more about monarchs across Georgia and her efforts. I know she's been fielding questions about milkweed and rabbits and deer. Um, I grew up in West Virginia, deer, deer are real, real bad with plants. Mom's <laughs> battling deer with plants right now outside, so. Susan, go ahead and tell us a little about what you do. Uh, well, I have several teacher workshops coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we help teachers to teach students about monarchs uh, and planting gardens for monarchs and pollinators. So that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, we also have a pollinator habitat certification program, similar to Monarch Watch's way station program, but specific to Georgia. So on our website, we have 
lots of resources, maybe a planting design, a plant list, uh, and resources from the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a, uh, a national organization which we're part of, uh, that will help you plant a garden here in Georgia. Um, we also, of course, do the Symbolic Migration Project, which is my deep passion, uh, where we, if you don't actually have a monarch that you could send to Mexico, you can make a paper monarch and send it down to Mexico. And it can be an ambassador to the students who live around the colonies of monarchs there. Um, and I think that Allie was going to put my website up there if people wanted to get more information about those different programs. Um, there are a couple of questions I see that have come into the Q&A. Um, yes. If anybody has any questions for me, you can also pop them in there as well. But uh, I'd love to hear Sarah's answers to these because I just think she's just so impressive and uh, a real adventurer. Excellent. So are you, Susan? Susan. <laughs> so we do, do you have a few, and I, I think I'm going to put them in a certain order because they kind of seem to flow. So the first question that we had um, was from SGZB, and they asked, how did you choose monarchs? I, well, I love frogs. They're my, probably my true passion, but frogs don't make the most exciting travel companions. They don't go super far and they, they don't tend to go to places like New York City and they're, they're just not as, as um, just they don't disperse quite as much and they're not quite as democratic they they don't they don't visit school kids in in Nebraska and farmers in Texas the same the same way and and so the more I learned about the monarch before I started my trip originally I just wanted to go visit them in Mexico and the the more I kind of learned about them the more I kept thinking wow they're they're they would be really good traveling companions like they're kind of like bicyclists in fact the monarch migration as as a whole, they, they, they progress about 25 to 30 miles a day. Uh, and, and so there are, the, the pace is really similar, especially if you if you think about I'm trying to go about 60 miles a day, but then I would take a rest day or a few rest days. And then roads don't tend to go exactly where you want. So really, we were quite, quite close to the same pace. And, and again, they're just they're such a great guide. They're such a great introduction into nature. And when you protect monarchs, you're protecting so many more species. And so it really just, the pieces seem to fit together. And I, I kind of feel like in some ways the monarchs found me as, as I was finding them. And, and now I just, I can't look back <laughs> where we are in this together now. Excellent. So there's another question um, from Kelly and she asks, did you feel safe traveling through Mexico by yourself? Also, where are the best places to travel in Mexico in order to view the overwintering of the monarchs? I, I love Mexico so much. So I've biked across Mexico. Well, I, I kind of did a, a, an out and back or from Michoacan, which is in Southern, South Central Mexico, near, near Mex a couple hours from New Mexico City um, to the border of Texas. I've done that northbound and southbound. And then I, I did another bike tour in 2013 where I biked across Mexico. And I just, I loved it so much. I love that there's this, there's a, a great, a great balance between rural with that sort of adventure and, and cities where you can buy more food and, and things like that. I, I love, I love that you can knock on a door in pretty much anywhere in rural Mexico and just say like, well, you sell me some food and they don't beat bad an eyelash. They're not like, wait, what? We're not a restaurant. They're like, ah, oh, sure. Come on in. <laughs> and I, I, I really have nothing bad to say about Mexico. I felt completely safe. I would, I would ask, you know, locals all the time. I'd say, hey, how do you feel about this road? And they'd say, oh yeah, that's great. Um, I, I just, I have nothing, I, I really didn't feel nervous really at all. And, and every night I found a, a wonderful camp spot. In fact, Mexico is a lot less, 
intense about trespassing laws. So people would are totally, typically are just totally fine with you camping wherever they, they're not as possessive about land as we are. It's a little bit more viewed as a, a common resource, which is really awesome. And then to visit the monarchs in Mexico, there's four sites that are open to the public and they're on the border between uh, Michoacan and the state of Mexico. And a quick Google search would, will really help you out there. The, the biggest one is El Rosario. That's probably the most touristy one as well. It's my favorite because that's the first one I went to and my guide, her name was Brianda. You have to have a guide at all of them. And she invited me to stay or to come back and I ended up living at her house. I am now really good friends with her entire family. I've, I've spent four winters with them now and I've gone to Brianda's wedding and I, I love it there so much and I miss them this winter, I didn't go. And, and so yeah, I would encourage folks that want to see the monarchs in Mexico to, to go do it. And it's always a little scary, but I, I, I think uh, if you can laugh at yourself when you make a lot of mistakes in Spanish and if you can point to maps and do this, you'll, you'll get all the help you need. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to combine these two questions. So a little bit on, on the technical stuff. Lori asks, how did you afford the time and the finances to travel all of this distance? And Kala asks, how many days did it take? It was eight and a half months. I think it was, I think I wrote it down here, 267 days, I want to say, something like that. And I only, I need about six, five, six dollars a day to survive. I don't eat at restaurants all that often. I don't pay for camping. I just camp where I want. I, all my clothes are used. I don't own a house. I don't own a car. So I don't have any, I don't have kids. So I don't have any expenditures really. And I also, so I, I live very simply to answer your question one. And so I don't need to work all the time. And as a seasonal wildlife biologist, I'll spend a few summers working, I'll save up my money, and then I'll be able, I'll be free to do it, to do what I want. And I just don't, I just don't apply for jobs. And then the other great thing is I would give presentations and, and sometimes people would pass around a hat and I'd collect a couple hundred dollars in a night. And then I'd live off of that for, for a few weeks at a time. And I would stay with people and they would give me a meal and a shower and send me send me down the road with snacks and and so I really was taken care of of by people and it's it's just not and not an expensive endeavor actually one of the um, comments that we have in the chat is from a Sarah with an H um, and she was mentioning um, that um, while you were in Ontario Canada um, the children weren't in school but you made a point of talking to her class that particular year. So went out of your, your way to, to talk about monarchs in her class while you're up there. So a couple other questions coming in. Um, and you know, and maybe Susan can answer a couple of these. There's some on milkweed as well. Um, and it, Susan asks, is it too late to plant milkweed seeds in Atlanta this year? And um, Jewel asks, um, she's she's Alyssa's mom. Um, is there another plant that you would recommend over here um, in the PNW? I'm sorry, I don't know what that, uh, but British Columbia. Pacific British Northwest. Columbia. Okay, uh, that pollinators could you um, you know benefit from over there. Um, and then Colette is saying, as a teacher, she taught about butterflies and the painted lady and the monarch and she would like more information on how to grow milkweed with success. So a lot of milkweed questions for you all. I'm gonna keep those all up and live just in case we need to revisit. Susan, I, I'll be happy to turn that over to you first and then I'll, I'll fill in too. Okay, um, so here in Georgia, we do not encourage people to plant common milkweed because it's not common here in Georgia. Um, it is only native to a few of our counties in the Northwest corner of the state. Uh, our most common milkweeds are uh, Asclepius tuberosa, which is that beautiful orange flowered one that you showed in one of your photos, Sarah. Um, and probably the other 
easiest one to find would be Asclepius tuberosa, which is called swamp milkweed, although it doesn't necessarily have to grow in a swamp. Um, it tolerates uh, wet feet, let's just say. So those are probably your two easiest ones to find here in Georgia. And I can put in the chat box uh, a link to a document that has those scientific names in it and resources for where you can find those. I always find it's better to look at scientific names because common names can get a little tricky. If you ask for butterfly weed and one nurseryman might say, well, this is a weed that butterflies come to, so I'm gonna call it butterfly weed. It's not always the same thing. So you need to be careful and look for scientific names. Um, all right, well, is there another question there? That's the I mean, yeah, let's say, let's well, maybe double back. So that the, um, the swamp milkweed, can we still plant that at this point? In oh, the year? yes. Yeah, you can plant uh, any of those milkweeds. The trick with milkweeds is that you need to cold, wet stratify the seeds, which means that you need to put the seeds in some wet sand in your refrigerator for four to eight weeks to trick them into believing they've been through a wet winter before you can plant them. So it's a little late to start now, but I wouldn't discourage it. I would say, go ahead and get those seeds in your refrigerator and you can get them out by the end of the summer. Yeah, the other thing I'd add to that is that every year more and more there's native plant nurseries that are popping up and there's native plant sales. Susan probably could put in some links to native plant sales and then you could bypass at least this year the, the seed the seed germination because it is a little a little bit of, of more work um, and you can go out and you can buy little starts of milkweeds and get them in the ground and it's a, a little a little bit more bang for your buck early on right um, you just want to make sure that you're you're buying them that they're organic that they haven't been sprayed the seeds haven't been sprayed because they that can affect the the pollen and the nectar and the flowers and then I, hi Alyssa's mom I, I wanted to jump in on that question she had a question about other plants to plant and it, it's just, if you can plant native plants of any type, that's that's a benefit. And and the monarchs are, they're generalists when it comes to nectar, they'll pretty much eat, they, they are not eat, they'll drink any nectar that they can get. I And it, the native plants are, are the best and they often are the, the healthiest for them as well. So any native plant that you like, put in the ground and it will be beneficial. The the, the milkweed, there are lots of species of milkweed too. And so you can you can start with those those easier to grow ones and then you can go down the rabbit hole of milkweed and discover all the amazing, amazing types and and everyone's gonna fall in love with a, a different a different species likely and and yeah. So any any plant that's native it will be the best plant. And the one that you think is the most beautiful will be the best plant. And we have a couple comments coming in as well. Um, there's just a, a, someone is anonymous said that they have acreage in Georgia and would love to plant in a larger volume. The Clepius tuberosa is what they've found growing wild here on the farm uh, and they're located in Columbia County, Georgia is uh -huh. where they're at. And then someone mentioned Phyllis Style says the, the Circe's Society has milkweed finder tool. Mm, yes. Yeah. yes, they do. And I see somebody in the chat box has put in the link to that document that I mentioned that has the um, milkweed species that are appropriate and those that are not appropriate. Asclepius corosophica, tropical milkweed is one of the species that we do not want people to plant here because there are some issues um, involving it the fact that it's not native and that it seems to encourage uh, the proliferation of a protozoan parasite that infects the monarchs. It sounds more complicated than it is really. Yeah. If, you can, if you can find a native nursery 
and get some native plants. <laughs> yeah. Then the, the adventure will unfold. And I have to say the first milkweeds I planted at my parents' house, they definitely all died. It's part of the adventure. <laughs> don't, don't get too upset with yourself. Just keep trying. The plants that want to grow in your soil with your amount of sunlight, with your amount of rainfall, they'll eventually sh find themselves or find you and they'll, they'll tell you by being the ones that don't die. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, don't, don't be discouraged. And I, I like to think one of the things that we don't do as much in the United States that I think we need to is really celebrate the, celebrate the season, celebrate the monarchs returning. And so I think a great way, what, a great thing to do is, is mark the occasion of the monarchs returning for the spring by planting more plants and every year, let your garden get bigger and, and maybe buy a few for you and buy a few for your neighbor and, and really just like, celebrate and keep keep planting it's it's never gonna you're, you're never gonna be finished with your garden you're always gonna be wanting to add more and change things up and and uh, brag to all your friends about all the milkweed you have growing so we do have a question uh, from Susan as well um, and she asks is there one particular highlight of your trip that stands out for you or you know like you mentioned earlier as you were collecting spoons, along the road, you, or what are some treasures that you found along the way too? <laughs> oh boy. Well, like I said, I collected spoons. I found a lot of spoons. I found a social security card from someone that I did, I was able to return. I found, I found a bunch of money. Um, and then of course, all the animals. That skunk that I showed a picture of was probably the, the, one of the coolest encounters I've had. Often there's animals like skunks and raccoons and opossums and armadillos that you see a lot and you, or squirrels even, and you see a lot and you're like, ah, oh, it's just a squirrel. But if you take the time to really look at them, you're like, that is the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. Like that skunk, I was able, I like zoomed past the skunk. Well, first I broke and I broke my, I broke my bike. I braked my bike. I slowed down on my bike. <laughs> and as I was slowing down, I was like, wait, what am I doing? This is a skunk. And I sped up and then I kind of snuck around and the skunk kind of came back to me and didn't know I was there. And I just watched him for probably 20 minutes. And it was just such a delightful little experience that I'm so happy I had. And and really like there weren't any crazy things that happened that there were like a lot of series of small little moments that just wouldn't have happened if I hadn't put myself out there, that I if I hadn't been on the road, if I hadn't been kind of letting the monarchs lead the way. So I, I'm kind of still talking. I don't exactly, I, don't, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> well, yeah, it, actually that's what I, I found really delightful about reading your book is, is that, you know, I loved the scene with the skunk and, and I, I was actually sitting there saying to myself, oh dear Lord, don't <laughs> the skunk spray, the skunk spray. And, and then you have to get the book and read it. it. It's very humorous and the solutions that were going through your head, but it was so personable. And, and, and I always enjoyed in the book where you were taking yourself and putting yourself in the other creatures mindset and, and in the butterflies mindset and sort of like bringing that back and saying, okay, well, you know, th th this is what I would do, but what we have to do or the butterfly, we have to, you know, we, we need to think of not just as ourselves, but as the other person or as the other creature. And it was just very, it, it was, it was so readable and refreshing. It just really was. Um, well, thank you. And it was wonderful on a gray Georgia day. Well, as we get ready to close everything out, um, we've got two more questions that I want to get to. I'm saving one for the end. So the folks from Evansville, Indiana, I'm not ignoring that question. I'm saving that one for last. But we do have one from Phyllis. And she asks, in your four winters in the sanctuaries, did you notice population fluctuations? I did notice differences in the populations. And often, so they do the counts of the monarchs. They don't go to the sanctuaries and go, one, two, three, four, five, you would, you would go mad. Instead, they count the area of land that the monarchs occupy. And because it's a, a total amount of all the sanctuaries and the, the amount fluctuates, but it can be as many as 18 small colonies throughout that I'm only seeing a piece of the puzzle, but there would be years where they would seem much in much bigger groups. And then the, the data would usually confirm that. 
So I, the, the 2017, the, that winter was, I think the lowest the population has been. And so I, I was, I was grateful that when I came back the next year, it was, it was quite a bit larger and I, I saw the difference and you could hear the difference and, and yeah, fingers, fingers crossed that, that it will main, continue to go up and not go down so much. Excellent. So before we all leave this evening, don't forget Eagle Eye Books. We put the link in the chat in a couple times. You can order from them and have signed book plates, um, put in the book for you and mail to your home. If you're local, you can do local pickup. Also, go to your local libraries and check it out your local libraries. Go to your local independent bookstore wherever you are in the United States. As I said in the introduction, they've done so much um, to keep us reading and to keep introducing new books during the pandemic and especially our black owned independent bookstores and businesses. They are so vital to our communities. And if we truly wanna build a just society and have a truly diverse literary community, we need to support them as well. So let me get to TJT's question. They are from Evansville, Indiana. And she says her daughter, Emily would like to know what you're up to these days after your journey. Well, the Monarchs continue to lead the adventure. I've been doing lots of interviews and presentations for my book. I also started a small outdoor science school or nature school with some friends. So um, you can find me a lot of days hanging outside and teaching kids about nature. Actually, I don't do a lot of the teaching. It's the trees and the, right now it's the cicadas are doing a lot of the teaching. And I'm kind of dreaming up new adventures. I started learning how to ride a horse this year and I've been learning about about that because I really want to ride a horse across Mexico. So that's the idea that's kind of simmering in my mind right now. And I'm hoping to, I'm working on a book for kids. This, I, I talked to a lot of kids on my trip. I, I think kids deserve to, to hear fun messages uh, about science and conservation and of people doing things that haven't been done before, like riding your bike with butterflies. And, and so I'm, I'm working on that book as well. So we'll see the Monarchs, hopefully we'll, we'll keep leading the adventure. Excellent, well, thank you so very much, Sarah. Thank you, Susan, for joining our talk this evening. It has been thank wonderfully you. informative and just so enlightening and enjoyable. We've had a lot of information in the chat. Somehow, maybe we'll put it in our newsletter as well when we send this link out so that everybody can access that. But do go check out beyondabook.org. Do check out Monarchs Across Georgia. Go plant some milk, legal milkweed. I don't know if it's really <laughs> illegal milkweed, but you know the proper species of milkweed um, out in our gardens and support our local bookstores and our local nurseries as well. Thank you all so very much for allowing us into your homes this evening. We will see you again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.